So, uh, data about developers, and I'd like for you to uh, welcome Stephen O'Grady again. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right, so... This thing just will not work. Okay, so, yeah, so we're going to go through a stats class. Well, no, no, I'm kidding. Um, really, what we're here to do to, to, uh, is to talk about sort of Red Monk analytics, but, you know, this isn't, you know, obviously a product pitch. We don't allow other people's product pitches, so we're sure it's not going to help. Uh, do one of our own. But basically the idea, as James said, is, is that when we started the company, we didn't do numbers, uh, and you know, largely because we just didn't think there were good numbers. So we had a lot of people, for example, come to us over the years and say, okay, I need a figure on you know, how many running instances in MySQL there are. And our answer always was, we, we can't tell you that, and nobody else can either, because nobody has that data. MySQL doesn't have that data, you know, really nobody does. You know, so you know, really what we've tried to do over the last couple of years is, is try to identify, okay, we, we still can't answer that question and still nobody can, but we can try to sort of get at um, and infer things, you know, from different data sources. So, you know, the first two talks that you heard this morning, uh, you know, were uh, Matt, you know, from Bitly and Greg from Untapped, you know, talking about how they use the data that their services generate, right? So in other words, you know, Bitly has 8 billion, um, you know, click impressions as they can sort of analyze and come to conclusions from. Um, Greg has, what was it, Greg? Four million plus check-ins now? 4.2 million check-ins. You know, so the point is here is, is that we're, we're in a world, you know, where we're all generating tons of information, and this information, if we take a look at it, can actually tell us some interesting things. So, you know, I wanted to do basically three things. You know, tell you basic, you know, go through the why, um, go through the what, and then we'll get into um, you know, some of the examples of the data. So you know, the why, you know, from our perspective in terms of Red Monk Analytics is really simple. It's this. This ultimately is why we do what we do. Because the sort of adoption of technologies is not reflected by what's purchased, is not reflected by what CIOs think is being used, they have basically very little to do with one another. Uh, and this is for a number of different trends. Open source has played a big role in this. Cloud has played a big role in this. Bring your own devices played a big role in this. Software as a service. You know, we can go on and on and on. But there are a lot of different reasons today that, you know, that, that top circle, you know, so CIOs and IT uh, managers, what they think is being used doesn't really reflect the reality. Uh, it's not, in many cases, even close. So, you know, really, you know, how do you get at answering that question that I talked about? How do you get at, okay, well, how many, you know, what is the significance of MySQL? How much is there? And not specifically that question, but questions like that. Because ultimately, we, you know, we're here to talk about developers. We're here to talk about the people actually implementing these technologies. How do we infer uh, answers about their behaviors? So, we started... Um, with our data. So we built a product called Redmonk Analytics, and Redmonk Analytics basically mines our stuff. So we've been putting out content for free for almost a decade, and what we do is basically watch what people do with that content. You know, we look for patterns, we look for trends, we look for insights, and, you know, I still remember the first time, you know, I was talking to Sun, um, and where's Brian Cantrell? So Brian's in the back of the room, um, and Brian may or may not be able to verify the fact that I talked to Sun for a long time about changing the shell in Solaris, and, you know, they just didn't want to pay attention. Um, and ultimately, I had to come back to them with a bunch of data, you know, from our site, you know, with literally dozens of people showing up a day just at our site saying, change Solaris shell, Solaris shell sucks, like, you know, all these different patterns, right? And these are the kinds of things we were generating. As I said, that's one small example. This is, this is happening dozens of times a day. So we sat back and said, well, what else is in our content? What else you know, are, are we generating and just not using? All right. So like I said, we started with our data. And there's a couple of example charts in here. Um, you know, we have a geo chart, um, search terms, you know, all these different kinds of things to try to basically get at, you know, these fundamental questions. What are developers doing? Where are they coming from? Um, what sites? What companies? You know, that's ultimately what we created. But, you know, I mean, we're still a small company, um, so we can only generate so much data. 
So the logical next step, you know, was to move to other people's data. Now, the interesting thing, we, we started going out and talking to other people about their data, is that, you know, there's a, there's a cycle, you know, that people go through, right? And this is, many of you in the room actually may still have yet to experience this cycle. Many of you, many of you uh, may have been through it. But there's three stages that everybody goes through with respect to data. So the first is denial. Now, you go out and you talk to people, you know, hey, you, you, know, you guys are generating data. There's lots of things that, you know, you have on hand. And the first thing that everybody tells you is, that, no, no, I, I'm telling you, we don't have any data. No, there's nothing we do that's interesting. I'm, I'm sure we don't have any interesting data. I know all these other companies do, but not us. You know, we're not generating anything interesting. And I can tell you for a fact that you're wrong. Anybody who says this is wrong. Because really, if you have any traction whatsoever, and I mean any traction, you have, some, you have some insight. Even if it's just about your product, your community, your niche, you have some insight. Now, all insights aren't created equal, of course, but you have something that has value. And this is something that you know, we have to sort of convince people. Which leads to stage two, acceptance. Acceptance usually looks like this. Oh, okay, so that's right. So we make builds for eight different operating system versions available. And we can actually tell you sort of, you know, hard numbers, you know, over tens of thousands of downloads, which distributions are preferred. So that's the kind of data you're talking about. Okay, yeah, all right, I, I accept that we have data, so I'm so this is, again, this is the second stage. You have to get to the point you know, where you've gone through that denial, no, 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 we don't have anything, I don't know what you're talking about, to this second stage that says, all right, yeah, maybe, maybe we actually have some, some stuff that you know, may be interesting. Which leads to the third stage. Once you sit down and actually talk to people about their data, about the data they're generating, and about the kinds of things they do, you, know, you can do with it, you know, they sit back and say, holy crap, like, I had no idea. So, this is, you know, sort of the big picture, you know, that sets up some of the examples that we'll go through. This is a conversation, if you take one thing away from this talk, and frankly, from my perspective, you take one thing away from this conference, if you guys go home and think about the data that you have, the data that you're generating, the data that your users are generating, whatever, and think about new interesting ways to put that to work, you know, to inform your development, to inform, um, you know, the way that you interact with your users, to inform, in many cases, your revenue strategies, that's a huge win from our perspective. But let's go through, you know, that's all abstract, that's, you know, sort of big picture stuff. So let's go through some examples. What, what are we talking about? You know, what does this data look like? So, I know we have some people, uh, we're the Mozilla folks. I know we have at least, okay, so you're not going to like this chart. My apologies. Um, we, uh, so I, I predicted last, uh, you know, in 2010, that in 2011, you know, we would see uh, Chrome eclipse Firefox's user share. And uh, unfortunately for our friends at Mozilla, that happened. Now, to be clear, this is not representative. You know, our audience is very different than the normal population. You know, 15 or 16 percent of our traffic is from Linux boxes. You know, the normal, you know, the sort of normal mainstream percentage is less than one percent. So, you know, uh, with the caveat that you know we're talking about a very different sort of unique audience that's very developer focused, um, these are the kinds of things that that we look at. These are the kinds of things that we pay attention to. What is the trend? You know, where are these things going? Because you know, ultimately, when you see major vendors releasing products that don't support Chrome, you know, we can go back to them and say, hey, look, you know, we have an intensely developer-focused audience. For our audience now, that's the most popular platform. So if you're trying to reach developers and you're not supporting that platform, you may want to rethink that. So again, simple example. One of the other things we do in the Red Monkey Analytics products is that we look at and rank uh, search queries, search terms, right? So this is uh, the, the default setting for the product is the past 30 days. 
So for the past 30 days, these are the top incoming queries to our property. You know, so we have Mongo versus MySQL, Facebook, PHP, HipHop, Cassandra, important software, cloud certification. That one I was curious. I didn't really expect that. OpenShift, DynamoDB, and these are my favorites. Java is dead. Is Java dead? Uh, Facebook, Cassandra, and then, you know, near and dear to our hearts, Monkey Grot. Exactly right. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that we, we pay attention to, right? We take a look at these in, in, on a very regular basis and say, all right, well, what are developers asking us? All right, because all of you have this data. If you have a website, you have this data. People are trying to tell you something about what they want, something about what they are curious about. So we, we look, you know, we monitor it. And uh, I think Jason's there. You guys will like this chart. So this is the data. If you run the query starting in uh, January of 2010, these are the top incoming queries. You know, so this is two years plus worth of data. And you know, the, the top two, obviously, here are node related. Now, we wrote a piece in 2010, I think midway through 2010, about node. And we wrote it because of things like this. Because of watching this data, node over an extended period of time destroys, it literally destroys every other framework in terms of the interest that we see attracted to our properties. The queries, uh, and there's all kinds of varieties, some of which don't make any sense. Um, but you know, these are the kinds of trends, these are kind of uh, sort of data that's handed to us that we put to work. And we put it to work by you know, drawing conclusions from that and presenting it back to users and customers. But as I said, it's not just our data, right? It's not just about what we can tell you. Because at the end of the day, what we want to be is the company that works with as much data as we can get our hands on. We will take it from people, we will scrape it, we will take data any way we can get it. And you know, one of the ways that we get it is by working with people who are um, like Black Duck. So how many of you guys in the room know Black Duck? Okay, uh, good number of you. Uh, for those of you who don't, they do source code, open source code management, um, you know, governance and so on. But among other things, they have a ton of data about open source projects, right? Because they crawl and index open source repositories. So, you know, they have uh, quite a bit going on. And, you know, talking to them, they're in the position of a lot of product companies where, you know, their job isn't necessarily to do analysis and to come to conclusions and, you know, crunch numbers like it is for us. So, you know, it's a partnership that actually works pretty well. You know, well, they'll come to us pretty regularly and say, hey, we have this data, what do you think? Um, anything in here. And, you know, a couple things, um, you know, first of all, this slide obviously is the rise of GitHub. Uh, you may have seen this on the blog this year. And basically, all I've done here uh, is take the commit volume, and this is for, uh, if I remember right, I think this is commits for the first half of 2011, uh, so the first two quarters worth of data, uh, just total commits across, you know, these four forges. Um, and I've ranked them here um, by age to sort of point out that GitHub's uh, popularity, overwhelming popularity, um, is really truly a phenomenon. And something, again, sort of worth noting, worth observing, and for all of you in the room, worth understanding and targeting and adjusting to, which is certainly what we see in practice. Uh, those of you in the room who are JavaScript people will probably like this chart. Um, this is also from uh, Black Duck Data, it's a different data set. So they gave us a snapshot from, uh, you know, their all-time commits, and they gave us a snapshot from, I can't even read it, I think it's March uh, 2011. And all we did was basically compare the changes in volume, right, the changes in percentage. Uh, and ultimately what we found was something that we have been arguing, uh, you know, about and for for a long time. You know, I can remember, you know, three or four years ago when the big analyst firms came out and said, hey, it's okay to use dynamic languages. And, you know, we we're, were saying, all right, doesn't matter if it's okay or not, they've been used by everybody for a decade. Um, that sort of claim on our part is now backed up by the data that we see, you know, which is basically that the dynamic languages are gaining in terms of their overall commits, right? So again, you know, these are the kinds of things that we can do with data. 
This one, uh, unfortunately, Chris Tacey isn't here today. Uh, Chris Tacey is a guy who works for uh, AppFog. Um, very good guy, CB Tacey on Twitter. Uh, he actually put this analysis together. I thought it was brilliant. Um, and ultimately, what he did was uh, get some data from the National Venture Capital Association and UNH Center for Venture Research and chart deal volume against deal size. And can anybody guess sort of the sort of impetus for this decoupling? I know there's at least two or three people in the room who are going to know what this is immediately. The question is, will they raise their hand? In the back. Exactly. Why? Good guess. Cloud? Amazon. Okay. So, you know, what you see from the data um, is, is that the decoupling kind of begins 2006, 2007. And if you recall, that is around the time that Amazon launched EC2. They launched EC2 and S3 both. I think S3 launched in March of 06. Um, EC2 launched in August of 06, I believe. So, you know, it, with um, uh, all, you know, sort of due respect to our, our uh, cloud friends in the room, who certainly played a role in this, you know, there is certainly evidence to suggest that that market uh, in 2006, you know, has had a profound, you know, sort of sustained impact um, on the number and, and volume of venture deals, um, as well as, you know, sort of the typical funding. So, you know, whoever it was in the room said that, you know, this is a, a matter of the cost of startups going down. That is absolutely correct. Uh, and particularly, you know, I mean, at the you know, sort of early part of 2000s, you know, when I was a systems integrator doing work with startups, I mean, the bills that you would have to pay to start a bit, I mean, it was obscene. You know, and these days, you know, you can start, you know, business is really on a song. So again, you know, these are some of the kinds of sort of interesting conclusions you can come to, um, you know, when you sit back and take a look at data that people have generated. Uh, this one I thought was interesting. Um, among the sort of data sources that we track, uh, internally are LinkedIn groups. So, you know, what we did, uh, what's the time frame here? Uh, so this is just, um, you know, basically two months worth of data. And, you know, we sort of run the numbers and say, all right, you know, what's the growth look like, you know, for these, you know, LinkedIn groups? And again, you know, this isn't hugely representative. It's certainly not a canonical data source, but, it, you know, when we see a pattern in a number of different disparate data sources, you can begin to infer things from that larger pattern. But amongst, LinkedIn, uh, amongst the LinkedIn data, you know, these were the communities that showed the highest growth. And we track, uh, I can't remember what it was, like 75 or 80, you know, different technology groups. So, um, OpenShift, uh, Cloud Foundry, Play Framework, Redis, and Git um, were all way, way up. Uh, and we don't, do we have any WebOS people in the room? Okay, that's good. All right, so the bad news for, for WebOS is that they were one of two groups that actually declined. Well, they had, a, I think, 0.2 or 0.5 um, uh, percent decline in terms of their overall LinkedIn group membership. So again, you know, just another data source, uh, just another data source that will give you insights in terms of uh, community growth, community behaviors, and so on. So this one I thought was interesting. Um, you know, you can all go to the GitHub page right now and sort of, you know, look this up. This will tell you exactly, you know, what the most popular languages are on GitHub, All right? So, okay, fine, who cares? Um, you know, I can look this up myself. The difference is, is that we record this every month. And what we end up doing is comparing snapshots by time to say, okay, well, this is great. This is the um, list now. What's changed? How does it compare to a month ago, three months ago, six months ago, All right? This is one of the things that we do. So when we looked at the data and compared it, uh, what was this? This is like a quarter. Um, these were the highest growth languages uh, in terms of the ones who jumped the most spots uh, on the popularity contest. And I thought it was, uh, Brian's going to be pissed about this. Brian, do you see the number one? It's going to trigger your nerd rage. <laughs> yeah, I got a shaking head. Um, I won't even mention the, the number one spot then, for fear of triggering said nerd rage. The, uh, uh, I, did th I find it very interesting, however, that you know, one of the, the um, highest gaining languages was Java, in fact. 
So, you know, you can see, you know, some of the others, Prolog, MATLAB, I, I wouldn't have figured that. Um, but there you go. And as I'm about to get the hook, um, I'm done, as a matter of fact. You are done. I'm done. Last slide. Awesome. Well, Dana's your friend.